Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com The 1911 is one of the most iconic firearms in history. Designed by John Browning, the 1911 was the standard issue sidearm of the U.S. military from 1911 to 1985. While Colt produced the original, almost every major firearm company has produced its own version. It's wildly revered for its reliability, crisp trigger, and is still a favorite for all types of shooters. Whether you're looking to buy or build a 1911 and just about everything for guns, log on to MidwayUSA.com. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. So this is the 250th episode of the podcast. That's a lot of uh, me talking. That means for the last 250 weeks, every week I have put out one of these, and I appreciate that you have been along for the ride, whether it be for the last 25 seconds or the last 250 episodes. So thank you for being part of something that I truly enjoy doing on a week in and week out basis. Of course, the podcast is just one part of casting across. I would say the best part of casting across is actually the website. It's the writing. And I've been doing that for a number of years, actually many, many more years than I've been doing the podcast. So make sure you go to castingacross.com if you haven't yet to check out all of the catalog of the articles, gear reviews, stories, things like that, that you can find there. Well, I'll talk more about casting across and more about me in the next couple of weeks. We've got some other uh, special podcast episodes on the docket. But today, as I've done for the 50th, 100th, 150th, 200th episode of the podcast, I am bringing some guests on. So if you are new to the podcast or relatively new, you haven't listened uh, for over a year, um, you've probably noticed that I am the only one that talks on this. Uh, there's a lot of great interview-based podcasts out there. Um people who sit around a table and talk among friends, people who have some of the leading names in fly fishing on, and people that introduce you to other folks in fly fishing that you might not otherwise know if you're only on social media or you're only out on the river. And I think those podcasts are great. They do a wonderful job of doing exactly what they do. And so I wanted to do something a little bit different. At the same time, I do want to integrate an essential part of my fly fishing and my time outdoors into the podcast every once in a while, every 50 weeks. And so what I do is I bring on my children. So uh, I'm talking to three of my four boys, and actually my dog is in the room also, but he looks like he's laying down. He was run pretty hard this morning. Uh, so I've got uh, four guests in the studio, as it were. The fifth member of the uh, the the boys is out at a doctor's appointment, and he's four. So he uh, he would certainly have something interesting to add, but uh, not not this day. So I'll have them introduce themselves one at a time. So, uh, gentlemen, your name, your age, and how about um, a, a book that you're reading right now? All right, go for it. My name is Timothy. I am 11 years old, and I have been reading Return of the King. My name is Daniel, and I am 9 years old, and I am reading The Van of Eagles for the second time. Hello, my name is Caleb. I am six years old, and I am reading Boxcar Children. Fantastic. We do a lot of reading in the house, and as you probably know, reading and books are a significant part of casting across. And so the boys have read some fly fishing books. I'm excited about introducing them to uh, some of the, the other ones that are on my shelf that I think are uh, suitable for children. Because fly fishermen and fly fishing authors have the tendency to be a salty lot. So we got to screen those things out. Well, what I wanted to do in this episode of the podcast is kind of two things, gentlemen, if that's okay with you. The first thing is we're going to talk a little bit about some of the outdoor stuff that we have done this summer. So this is being recorded at the end of August, and uh, we have had a lot of opportunities to be outside and do things that are, are a lot of fun for us as a family. 
and really run parallel or kind of correspond to what we what we talk about here on Casting Across. So probably the biggest thing that we did, the biggest outdoor experience that we had was a uh, about a two week trip that we had when we went down to Virginia. So, Caleb, because you're the only one in the family that was born in Virginia, I'll have you answer this. Uh, why did we go down to Virginia? What was the what was the point? So we could see our cousins and our grandparents. That's right. And our grandparents, uh, your grandparents, built a new home, uh, and it's at the foot of the mountains. And what is in the backyard? A big lake. A big lake. So this was this was a big part of our trip. So, uh, Daniel, pretty much every morning, sometimes in the afternoon, and every night, where were we? On the boat, fishing. On the boat, fishing. So tell me something, tell me a quick story about uh, your time when we were out fishing uh, in Grandma and Papa's lake so i was out fishing and um i didn't really catch anything we were niche, uh, paddling around and then i got a big tug wheel in a huge bass it was a pretty pretty large bass i mean what did it, it made the boat move which is always a lot of fun to see that happen and this was kind of the first big fish that any of us uh my, my boys their cousins you know my, my nieces and nephews this was really the first big fish any of us had caught so daniel was pretty pumped about that after being skunked for uh, a couple hours so that was exciting timothy uh you spent a lot of time out on the water um you you really took advantage of this opportunity to have the the, the lake right there didn't have to drive anywhere. We just want to walk down, hop in the canoe, and get out in the water. Uh, tell me some things that you noticed or observed about this lake, about fishing in this lake, about fishing in Virginia. It's a reservoir, so it's shallow on one side, but really deep on the other. It is. It has a bunch of little coves that are super shallow, but also have a lot of fish in it in them. Uh, and there are also bluegill spawning grounds. So uh, the bluegill spawning grounds was interesting because we were there in July, and that means that there was a second spawn, which happens sometimes in warmer climates, and lots and lots of lots of bluegill. Any any particular story or fishing experience that you wanted to share? Sure, I was fishing for bluegill, but uh, then I felt a really strong tug, and uh, the boat was pulled uh, into the middle of the lake. And when I finally reeled it in, there was a bass, probably eighteen inches long. Yeah, that was the biggest one I think that we saw caught all all week. I think it's bigger than any of the fish that I caught. It was it was perfectly proportioned too. And the cool thing about this lake is that there wasn't any public access. So there's a lot of ways to get to it, but it was primarily uh, by the, the landowners that surround the lake. And so even though you could access the lake in a few places that uh, were public, it was very, very tricky. You'd have to haul a canoe or a kayak or wade out into the swampy area uh, to get to that water if you didn't have uh, access. But because of that, I, I, the fish were ready to play ball and willing to to be very active. So that was... That was a lot of fun. So uh, anything else from, from that pond that anybody noticed or anybody wanted to mention? Snapping turtles were huge. <laughs> That's right. There's one that was, I mean, it was like a tire uh, with moss growing on its back. It was definitely a little bit unnerving. And uh, anybody who wanted to swim, I think, uh, after they saw that was, was, was done. We also saw some beavers, and when we were paddling, we got really close to it, and then from the shore we got, we saw a beaver going into its lodge. And what were the beavers in a constant state of doing with their tails in the water? Slapping. Yeah, it's, it is, if, if you've not seen this or heard this firsthand, it really is like someone throwing a bowling ball in the water. Initially, everyone thinks, oh, there's this giant fish that's jumping and then you realize it would it would need to be a fish the size of a, a a golden retriever to make this kind of sound. So something else that you guys did that I thought was very clever, uh, even the big kids, is that you found a fishing spot that required you to use a particular type of gear and technique. So does one of you want to tell me about that? So there was like this little ledge that we had to slide down on, and then it just dropped down in the water. So we got a rope, tied it to a tree, slid down, but then we got a baby fishing rod with like a good spinner, and at the bottom of the ledge were lots of crappy. So we just used that, and we caught a few. 
So yeah, that you had to have a rope to get down to this ledge. And then when we got down to the ledge, there was so much brush overhead that a normal fishing rod, fly rod, or even a conventional rod wasn't going to do the trick. There was too much brush. So you guys went and found like the, the little kid fishing rods, like the two and a half foot one piece numbers. And that's what you, uh, you use to, to get lures out there. I thought it was incredibly clever and, uh, I'm glad it worked out for you guys. All right. Well, shifting to other things that we saw and did outdoors this summer, it could be fishing, it could be not fishing. What's something else that you, you did or that you enjoyed? So earlier this summer, we took a uh, big nine mile hike uh, on the Franconia Notch Loop in northern New Hampshire. Yeah, so that actually summits some of the tallest mountains in the White Mountains. It's not in the presidential range, but they're they're pretty intense. So um, the two older guys, Timothy and Daniel, did that. Daniel, what were some of your thoughts or memories from that hike? It was really fun. So we went camping with a couple of friends. After that, like we drove down, and, and when we camped, and, and then also about the hike. It was, everyone thought that the, the little hay sca- stack, the smallest one was going to, is like the hardest. And then they go, the, like, no, when we did the last one. And so, yeah. Yeah, there's three peaks, Little Haystack, Lincoln, and Lafayette, and they're just spectacular views, 360-degree uh, views, rocky uh, alpine zone, and I'm really proud of my guys and all the, the other kids that, that did it with us. Um, what I said earlier when we did it is, like, I've you know, no screens, uh, no one asked for technology uh, for a good two days. That was pretty, pretty great. How about you, Caleb? You did not go on that hike with us. I'm pretty sure that you're probably close to doing it. So, um, but with that, with that said, what was something else this summer outdoors that you really enjoyed or are looking forward to? I'm looking forward to using my new best lure. Your new best lure. And what is your best lure? It's a rainbow trout rooster tail, and I caught lots of fish on it. That's right. That was that got lost some time over the last few weeks as we've been out fishing. And so uh, we passed Bass Pro Shop recently and uh, Caleb was adamant that we stop and uh, he get multiple rooster tails in a rainbow trout pattern uh, so that he could he could fish, which is a really clever thing to do because a lot of the ponds that we fish around here, they do stock with little trout uh, all, all springtime and the bass get really hungry for them. I'm sure catching those trout is a lot of fun, but I think the better value like Caleb has picked up on is chasing those bass that key in on that pink, green spots, that kind of pattern. Okay, something that you guys wanted to do that we've done in previous editions of these interviews is for you to ask me questions and then for you to give actually the answers to your own questions as well. This is something that I've heard from listeners that they enjoyed. So uh, with that said, Daniel, uh, what what is your question for me? What is your question for your brothers? And, and what do you want to know? Would you rather fish in a salt water or fresh water? Okay, so that's a very good question. Would I rather? So this is interesting. I I mean, there's nothing like the tug of a striped bass or a bluefish or some other large fish that we could uh, get into when we fish close to home here where we live in, in, uh, in New England. Uh, that being said, I am not a saltwater angler. That's not my, my comfort zone. I know how to do it. I enjoy it. I'm productive and successful when I do it. But I enjoy fishing freshwater. It's what I grew up doing. It is how I got into fly fishing. So not only freshwater is an answer, but a small mountain stream. I feel very comfortable, and it has kind of got that sense of home uh, when I'm on a water body like that. What about you, Daniel? I would. I don't think I've ever gone saltwater fishing, but so I would actually choose freshwater. All right. Very good. Caleb, what is your question for the room? What snack would you bring on a fishing trip? All right. I think everyone needs to answer this. Uh, we'll tell you what. Let me think about it. What What would you say, Caleb? Gummy bears. <laughs> Do you have a gummy bear brand that you would like to choose? Haribo. Haribo is definitely the right answer. So a snack for me to bring while I'm fishing. Like if it's on the water... I think like uh, beef jerky. What's that brand? Epic. The uh, it's more like pemmican. It's like the ground up stuff. That is as far as like a like a functional snack. That's definitely my, my choice. But as far as like somebody eating the car, I don't know, like a big box of Good and Plenty. I think would be what what I would go with. Timothy, what do you think? 
Haribo Twin Snakes. Haribo Twin Snakes. One side salty, one, or not salty, one side sweet, and one side sour. What about you, Daniel Calvin? So I've got a few. One, like every kind of Haribo gummy bears. I've been almost, I've eaten almost all of them. Those are a big favorite for my birthday. Judah got me a party size all for myself. I ate them in my room. And also I got like Z-Bars, like the chocolate brownie are one of my favorites. And yeah. Yeah, so Z-Bars are the kids' cliff bars, which they, they want to eat just on a normal day, but you know we save those for, for activity. As you can tell, gummy bears are an important part of the family, and this is, this is kind of how this has in, intensified. There is a dollar tree right next to the baseball field where the kids play baseball, and so I have very little self-control after I drop them off and they kind of get warmed up and all that. I'll walk over there and bag two, buy two or three bags of different kinds of Haribo gummy bears. All right, Timothy, what is your question for the group? Poppers or streamers? Poppers or streamers? So that's an excellent question. So we're talking warm water, uh, if we're using poppers. I mean, you can always use a popper for like a like a, a striper or for even, I guess, for trout. Um, I, I love fishing topwater. I think more often than not, if the opportunity presents itself, I'm going to fish a dry fly. I'm going to fish a popper. I'm going to fish a slider. I'm going to throw a, uh, like a, a spook or some sort of, uh, a topwater lure. If I'm fishing with conventional gear, uh, if I'm in the surf and there's fish blitzing, I will tie, I will tie on a popper and cut off the thing that's been working because I want to fish in that way. Uh, so I am unashamed in saying that's what I would do. How about you? I'd rather pop her. I just like the way the water moves when you um, pop it. You know, I think there's something to be said for paying attention to fishing a lure and your presentation when you can see it. I think we probably talked about this before. I think you can be more patient and more deliberate when you're fishing a popper than if you're fishing a streamer. I know a lot of times, especially when I was younger, I would really just reel a streamer, reel, well, strip a streamer or reel a lure in until I can see it. And that's when I start to fish very deliberately because I'm watching the action. I'm watching that worm bounce on the bottom. I'm watching that woolly bugger kind of dance and twitch in the current. And so when you're fishing a topwater fly or a topwater lure, you get that experience the entire time that the lure or the fly is out there. So I think, unless you're really disciplined, and I think I've gotten to this point, but I think it's easier to be disciplined in presenting the lure, fly, whatever you're using well, if you can see it. And a topwater lure pr gives you the opportunity. Plus, it's fun to watch fish jump up and smash it. Okay, gents. Well, we are coming up on the close of the podcast. So one more question. Uh, we are closing in on fall as well. Uh, fall is only a couple weeks away, but that means that we have a lot of opportunity for fishing still. We have opportunity for hiking still and hunting seasons right on the corner. So what is one goal that you have as we move towards the fall? Daniel, what about you? I've been hunt duck hunting for like about a year now, so this will be our second year. I saw a duck in the butt the last time that time, but it never came down. So my goal is to kill a duck. That's right. We're gonna make sure that we gather not just feathers but also meat. That's very very important. How about you, Caleb? What's something that you want to do this upcoming uh, season? Duck hunting. Yeah, to, Caleb's never been duck hunting. He's just uh, come come uh, downstairs to see uh, birds out on the back porch being plucked. So he wants to be in on the party this year. Timothy, how about you? So last year I got my first duck. So this year, uh, I last year I got a mallard. A mallard. So this year I want a wood duck. All right. Well, that's that's my goal as well. So I've never gotten a big male wood duck and I I don't have like a ton of desire to have a mount in my house, but a really really plumaged up male wood duck is what I want. Uh and so got lots of other species, lots of good numbers in, in previous seasons, but a good male wood duck that is worthy of mounting is one of my goals as we move into the season. And also um, just to, I'll answer two times, uh, getting into some really nice, uh, brook trout before, uh, before the spawn kicks in, because that's something that is always on every fall list that I have. Oh, wh what do you have to add, Daniel? 
So I'm back to our dog Ember. Even though he isn't even one year old yet, I'm I w- am hoping that we can bring him out on duck hunting, like for the last few weeks. Well, we will see. Getting children to behave is one thing. Getting a dog that might not have the uh, duck hunting. Uh, pedigree is is another but we'll see i know people that have spent lots and lots of money on duck dogs and they haven't uh panned out and so our little husky lab mutt may very well be exactly what we need to uh, make it so that i'm not the one who has to go out and retrieve downed birds well boys thank you once again for being on the podcast i know that timothy and daniel you've done this every time caleb you've done this many times um, one of the things that I think, as I've said before, is essential for people to understand is that casting across uh, my fly fishing is indelibly linked to the fact that I am a dad and I'm a dad of boys. And so I am thankful for each one of you, as well as your little brother, and that you get to be a part of everything that I do and uh, and everything, not, not just outdoors, but everything in, in period, you guys are a blessing. And I'm very thankful for you. And so I'm also happy and this is something interesting. Uh, your mom and I, when when we found out we were pregnant with Timothy, so this is going back, you know, a, a dozen years now. Uh, we prayed that we'd have kids that love being outside. There's other things that we prayed for, other things that we have put as a higher priority, but we we wanted to include that because it does matter to us. And we have been blessed and we've been rewarded uh, with with kids that all love being inside. You guys do like a screen every now and again, but uh, I think given your choice, you'd rather be in the woods than in front of uh, uh, the TV. Okay, well, before I wrap up, why don't you guys say uh, au revoir to the audience? Au revoir. Bye. Wale. All right. Well, this week on castingacross.com, two articles as per usual. The first one was called Trout Routes, Five Things I've Seen. So I've been using the app and the website Trout Routes for about six months, and the boys have as well, actually. Uh, They've clicked on it and scrolled around, and they actually, they were the ones that uh, first came to me with some intel on some of the trout fishing around where we were going to be in Virginia, because they had scrolled down to the Mid-Atlantic, and they'd spent some time tapping around. That was really fun to see. So anyway, I share five things that had become uh, apparent, or actually five things that had developed since I started using the app back in February. When I started using the app in February, when I wrote an initial article on my my thoughts and first impressions, it was all very like hypothetical because it was February. So the, the fishing wasn't what it was this summer. Uh, and like I said, uh, the app has come uh, in leaps and bounds in being having more feature rich and some accessibility features. Uh, so I've added five things that I have observed after using and playing with this app for the last five or excuse me, six months. Wednesday's article was called Rusty Flybox Birthday. And uh, Rusty Flybox pieces are where I take three pieces from the archives and I put them together based around the theme. So as I am quickly drawing near when this releases, I will be less than 48 hours away from a milestone birthday. And uh, I'm feeling okay about it. But uh, I I write... uh, about my own experiences, n- not that much on, on on the website, but there are three posts that I include this week. Uh, one of them has to do with my early childhood, uh, my early fishing. One of them has to do with my early fly fishing, and one of them has to do with me. Now, like I said before, this is I, I'm not the focus of casting across, uh, but I will be talking about uh, an introduction, as it were, in the next couple of weeks. But this is a a cool group of articles uh, and they talk not just about those first fish uh, but also what they meant and how they've kind of played into uh, what you read and what you listen to if you uh, take in anything from casting across this week's recommendation is another pair of pants from eastern mountain sports Uh, and this week it is the ems men's compass four points pants so these look like khakis, but they are a nylon uh, and spandex material. Uh, I will wear them to work. I will wear them on the trail. I will wear them under my waders on the stream. So they are not going to absorb a lot of moisture like a um, 
like a pair of, of cotton blend pants, but they are going to dry off incredibly quickly. They're very wrinkle resistant. This is a great pair of pants to travel with. Uh, again, from a distance, they look like a, just a normal pair of casual pants, uh, but they are very, very lightweight. They're going to resist stains. They're going to resist wrinkling. They're going to dry out very, very quickly. Um, again, this is this would be a great pair of pants to wear if you like to wet wade in long pants. And right now, as this is being recorded in August, uh, EMS is closing out their summary stuff. And so right now I'm on the website and I think every color is on sale and they range from your browns to your grays uh, and everything in between. And uh, they're running low on sizes, but this is the kind of thing too, though, that if you wait for a few months and they'll start to restock and put all of those sizes back in there. Regularly, they retail for 70 bucks. I don't think I've ever paid more than 30 for them. I wait until they go on sale and I make sure I can grab them in my size. But a great pair of pants that are fine for kicking around in, or even again, if you're able to wear something a little bit more casual to work, uh, you can dress it up with a polo shirt or even just a, a nice button down shirt. And uh, it's certainly not going to be uh, looking like you're ready for the board meeting, but uh, you're, you're fine for sitting at the desk and uh, being out and about. So again, I'll put a link for the Compass Four Point Pants in uh, this episode's show notes over at castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and then rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. Life that has the stories to back it. A life to be proud of. It's a Winchester life. Yeah, baby. Six eight Western. Oh, I'm old there, baby. Right there. Tune in every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern on Waypoint TV.